Starting to Becoming podcast is all about the changes, transitions, and transformations we encounter on our journey to aligning with purpose and living life with intentionality, fulfillment, and impact. I'm your host, Sabine Gideon, and my mission is to help those starting their entrepreneurial journeys or simply shifting gears to better align with purpose by sharing the journeys of others, offering practical tips and strategies, and providing encouragement to help you pull through whatever obstacle is standing in your way. So I invite you to sit back, relax, and join me on this journey of discovery. Joining us on today's episode of the Journey to Becoming podcast is Simone Canego. Simone is the best-selling author of The Extraordinary Unordinary You, as well as a speaker, entrepreneur, and a mother to six multicultural children. Sharing her journey of adopting three of her six children in foreign countries, her climb of Mount Kilimanjaro to raise cancer awareness, and all the inspiring stories that came along the way, Simone instills powerful lessons on what really matters most. Welcome to the show, Simone. So excited to have you. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Oh my goodness. Okay. Walk us through your journey, your life experiences, and and your story of how you came to be who you are today. How many hours do we have? (laughs) (laughs) I started my journey not anywhere close to where I am today. So changed my mind many times. I started off in when in college, I went into accounting. I have a CPA. I have a master's in accounting. And I've had people say, did you think you would have six kids? Did you ever want six kids? And I was like, I actually didn't think I would have kids, maybe one. (laughs) So you never know where life is going to take you. And I did a lot. I've tried a lot of different things in my life, trying to figure out me, trying to figure out what I wanted. I went back to school to be a teacher. I worked in medical sales for a while, among other things. And then I realized that what I really love and what I feel that the place I feel like I can truly make a difference is in storytelling, is sharing my stories, the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it, not just the shiny moments, because as humans, we connect on the difficult moments, the struggles, and it's so important that we share those. So this is what I'm doing now. I wrote a book. I love speaking. I love getting up in front of groups, which is, again, something that I never thought I would be doing, but I absolutely love it. Awesome. Awesome. So you go from accounting to teaching to sales. At what point did did you have that moment that was just like, okay, none of these are it. Speaking is the thing for me. So I actually figured out that speaking was the thing when I was doing volunteer work. I had the opportunity to visit different communities and get up in front of different groups and speak. And I was like, wow, I really like this. And this makes an impact. And that was the most important thing for me was that I was actually, if I could impact that one person doesn't have to be two, doesn't have to be three. It can be one person that's listening. Then I really feel like I've made a difference and I feel good about myself. And so I, that's the journey that I'm on now. And it's what I really love. I love it. I love it. Okay. So I'm curious, six kids is a lot of kids. (laughs) That is a lot to manage and a full-time career and speaking and everything else. If you wouldn't mind share with us, what was that journey like? We started off after we had one child, (laughs) my husband was like, I think we're good. And I was like, no, I I think I want more now. I was like backwards of how we started. He actually wanted six to begin with the magic number. And so after we had our first, it was about four years in between our first and our second. And so we had talked about adoption at that point. And then of course, magically, I found out I was pregnant. So we ended up moving to Florida after our second child was born. Eight, she was eight weeks old and I drove the U-Haul with the dogs and everything to <laughs> and the newborn baby to back to Florida. And, and then we had one more child and then we, we had the discussion. We're like, it's the now or never. And we like the now. So we said, let's do it. And we, our son, Noah, who is turning 15 this weekend, he is from South Korea. And he came home at four months old and 
our life was complete chaos. He would cry all the time, (laughs) no matter what we did naked clothes on in the bathtub, in the car, you would go for three hours in the car. He would cry the entire time. Now that he's 15, that doesn't happen so much. So, but we still, we felt like we, we wanted to do it again. And so we adopted our son, Ari. He was four and a half years old and he's from Ethiopia. And actually when we were at the orphanage, we had our older girls with us on that trip. And we decided at that moment that we were going to come back again because there were just so many amazing kids just waiting for a family to love them. And we're like, okay, we can be this family. And so we came back one more time and we adopted our daughter, Millie, and she was two and a half years old. Oh, wow. Wow. So I can't even imagine how challenging that whole process is, right? It's six kids first and foremost, but you know, you're integrating new individuals into the household, into the family every few years or so outside of the journey itself, right? Or outside of the process itself, what has that whole experience really taught you about you? Oh, it's taught me a lot of things and my kids teach me more every day, but it really has taught me that I am capable of much more than I ever thought I could be. When they say that, give a busy person something to do and then they'll get it done. And that's definitely true in my life. And also the capacity to love there. There's always more than enough love, but really looking at every challenge that we've had has just made me stronger, made me a better parent, made me a better human and really seeing the world in a different way from six different perspectives, plus my husband. So we, every conversation we have, I learned something new because they bring so much to our family. And how do you this is more of a me question. The audience is just here to hear this, but like, how do you balance all of this? So like what strategies, what techniques do you have in place to help you manage your time, help you manage everyone's schedules, everyone's activities, your traveling schedule. Now that we could go back outside. I learned early on that I can't stress about the small stuff. I know there's like books on that. Don't stress about the small stuff. And it's absolutely true. I will make a list. I'll lose the list. I'll find the list again and realize when I found the list, oh, I already accomplished everything on the list. A couple of things will fall by the wayside, but I really try to do the things that I know are most important. Anything to do with the kid's school and anything kid-wise, that kind of is the first thing that I really focus on so that I get all of that stuff done. But There are days that things just don't get done and that's okay. That's what tomorrow is for. So I don't let myself get really caught up in really getting upset about anything that I know I can't control. I know I'm going to get to things when I can, but yeah, I have a process for kind of everything. I joke about the, the list, losing the list. I am old school in that I write it on a piece of paper, but what I decided to do was to now write it on a pink piece of paper and now I don't lose it because I can see it anywhere in the house. It doesn't, I don't think it's one of the kids' papers and gets put in a pile. So I'm like, oh, that's a good strategy, a pink piece of paper for my list. (laughs) Um, But there's, yeah, there's a lot of things that we do, but I think the biggest thing is that I give myself permission to mess up. It's okay. There's many days where I'm like, oh, I forgot that. Oh, you have a concert tomorrow. We got to run out at eight o'clock at night to get you a new pair of black pants because your black pants are like four inches too short. I can't stress about that stuff. I just have to get it done and move on to the next thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And how do you fit in or I'm assuming here, do you fit in self-care? And if so, how do you fit in self-care or just personal time for you? Weekends are the self-care time as much as I can. I also, when the kids were little, they it would be like eight o'clock and they'd come down at like 8.15. They're like, mom. I'm like, nope, mom was off duty at eight o'clock. Remember? Off duty is at eight (laughs) o'clock. They'd be like, but I'm like, ask me tomorrow. (laughs) So you do, you have to prioritize those things because I truly believe for me that it makes me a better person to have some time for myself. So whether it's Saturday afternoon, sitting on the couch and watching a movie and drinking a glass of wine, that's self-care for me. Taking a walk, self-care. Anything where I can kind of regroup 
first thing in the morning, I think of it as self-care. I do positive affirmations first thing in the morning. And that kind of gets me started and gets me in a mindset where I feel like, okay, whatever comes through, I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. I'm a big affirmations person as well. So switching gears here, if you wouldn't mind, share with us a little bit more about what inspired you to make that climb up Kilimanjaro. Uh, so I, I, I don't have like an exact answer of why it kind of more fell in my lap and people laugh when I say that, but it, it's true. My, my husband was asked to do it. His, his best friend had climbed it the year before and they were putting together another team. And so he called my husband and said, are you interested? They're putting together another team. And my husband said, no, thank you. Call Simone. <laughs> he tells the story a little bit differently than me, but that's okay. And they and he did. He called me and I said, absolutely. And I had never climbed anything before. I I joke that I have like steps in my house. That's about it. I went camping a couple of times. So if you look at someone who kind of said yes and had to figure it out, that was me. And I did though. I my commitment was that. I'm going to work out every day to get myself in shape for it and really have that mindset of that I'm going to accomplish this goal. Also, the mindset of, and it's okay to fail. Like when you make mistakes, when things happen, it's okay. You learn from it, you move forward. But really, I never, I would picture myself on the top of the mountain. I wouldn't think I'm not going to make it. I had people say, Do you really think you're going to make it to the top? Oh, no, I think I'm going to make it halfway. That's why I'm doing this. Like, hello. <laughs> So it's funny what people will say, right? I'm like, yeah, I really think I'm, thank you for your support. I really think I'm going to make it to the top. And so I did. And it was really a powerful moment for me as a mom of six. I was 42 years old. I had a bad knee, but my mindset was, you're going to do this. And so even when it got tough, I thought about my kids, my husband, and thought about their support and how I can move forward. And that's how I that's how I tackled it. Love that. How long did you train for that? I trained for six months. I think that you can train for longer, but when I committed, I had six months. So that was all the training I could do. But I really I took it very seriously to the point where I had this elevation training mask. So it goes it has these valves and you can switch out the valves to kind of simulate it doesn't have anything to do with oxygen but it simulates like you have to breathe really hard to get the air in so it would help build lung capacity and i would wear it around the house i would wear it to the gym the kids were like oh my gosh mom this is so embarrassing actually i think these days because everybody wears a mask i think it would be okay and it had like a gorilla face on it which made it even better to bug the kids with <laughs> you would fit right in right in if it were 2020 i love that that's that's determination but one thing that you, you said through that process was you envisioned right the end right like you saw it you kept it as like your anchor your why your your deep motivator of why you were going through that even when it was tough and oftentimes that's the thing that makes or breaks us reaching a goal doesn't necessarily mean climbing a mountain, but you know, it's that vision of this is what it's going to look like that is usually the anchor or the thing that helps us move forward. So yeah. I love that. I look at it as what's your mountain? People, most people don't want to climb Kilimanjaro. That's funny because I, I, I would say to someone, I would tell the story and then they would say, well, I could never do that. I'm like, do you want to do that? And they're like, no, I would never want to do that. I said, okay, then change your words because it's not that you can't do it. It's that you don't want to do it. So when you set a goal and you put in the work behind it and you see yourself at the end, the big part is putting in the work. I've set many goals in the past where I'm like, I'm going to start this on January 1st. And then January 2nd, I'm like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> so, but it's really important to, to put in the work to achieve the goal. Yeah, absolutely. You got to want it. As you were talking, I was just like, I live in, in California currently and just to go out hiking out here, I'm like, uh, I, <laughs> I barely can make it through a, what's called an easy hike out here. So I, I have all the respect for you for being able to do that. And, and something else that you mentioned of having the support of your kids, having the support of your family, wanting to be an example for them in, in starting something and finishing. I think that's even a more powerful why or anchor 
in addition to obviously envisioning it and being able to say, as your street creds, I climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. So I love that. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Wanted to take a quick break to share some exciting news. Oh, I'm excited to share the relaunch of my Transform Her program. This 90 day accelerator has been specifically redesigned to support those currently facing or considering a shift in life, career, or business. The 90 day accelerator is jam packed with training, coaching, and a ton of personalized resources to move you from scared to confident, thinking about it to doing it, striving to thriving, and of course, stuck to unstoppable. So if you're at the place where you want to or are ready to make that major shift in your life, career, or business, but are feeling stuck, not sure where to begin, or are just scared, and trust me, there's nothing wrong with that because we've all been there, you can learn more about the 90 Day Accelerator on my website at www.sabinegideon.com slash transform her on the site. You can schedule a complimentary call to see if the program is right for you. switch gears a little and, and want to hear a little bit more about about your book and what led you to even again that's another endeavor all in itself right to write a book what inspired you what are some of the stories that you share that are ones that still stick with you or, or were defining moments for you in becoming who you are today I decided to write it after I had been doing some speaking and people would say to me, I would finish, get off the stage and they're like, have you, do you have a book? No, I, I don't, I'm not a writer. They're like, well, you should write a book. And again, limiting myself by saying, I'm not a writer. Well, you know what? I'm a storyteller. And so figuring out how to put my stories down on paper. Yeah, it was challenging, but I really was another thing determined to get it done, set a date in the calendar and said, you have to have it by this date. And once you get to this date, you're not going to continue editing or anything because I could have done it for 10 more years, right? I would be like, oh, no, it's not exactly. And yeah, there were mistakes. There's even when you have editors look at stuff, There's you, your brain sees what it wants to see sometimes. And so sometimes you miss a word or two or three. So that's kind of how like the idea started. But what I, the underlying theme for the book really came to me when I was sitting in this women's luncheon and there were these motivational speakers on stage and I was not in a good mindset. I've struggled with weight my my for years and feeling good about myself and am I making a difference in the world? All of these things that I really was feeling down about myself and listening to this these motivational speakers, I actually when they finished speaking I felt a little bit bad about myself because my first thought was that will never be me. And then I said to myself, and that's the whole point. You're not supposed to be them. You're supposed to be the best you can be. Stop being so hard on yourself. Take a look at the things that you're already doing. Take a look at who you are and the impact that you can make on the world. And that's kind of how I I went through things. And so really what I my the underlying theme for the book is that we don't need to change who we are we need to change the way we see ourselves so when we start believing in ourselves really truly believing in ourselves i really feel like the world opens up to us it's you're willing to try new things you're willing to take on new challenges interact with people that you may never have interacted with before and i think that was kind of how i started with the book and there's lots of there's lots of stories Again, with six kids and a husband, it's like endless material. I can imagine. I can imagine. So a couple of things that you said was really, it's really important to um, take stock and take inventory of the things that, you know, we've accomplished individually. It's so easy, especially nowadays with social media and to be an entrepreneur, to fall into that comparison trap because you're looking at everyone's highlight reels, right? You're looking at the glamorous and the pretty grids and whatnot. And, and it's so easy to step into that place. But 
to your point, we all have lived experiences that make us unique, that make us individually just as powerful or just as extraordinary. And then that self-acceptance around the belief of you're good, you're great, you're awesome, you're extraordinary just because you're you. So I, I love those takeaways. Are there in within the book, in terms of strategies, you mentioned earlier that you, you struggled with your weight and kind of how you saw yourself. Were there things that you started to incorporate in your life to start to help you shift your mindset or shift your belief in how you see you? Definitely. It's funny because I didn't, within the book, I really didn't give strategies. I really talked about my stories, my life, but because really the underlying theme is that we don't need to change who we are. We need to change the way we see ourselves. I didn't want to give strategies for, because most books will tell you, oh, do these four things, do these 10 things. And so that wasn't where I wanted to go with it. I just kind of wanted to talk about how I, my realization, the things that I I've done in in my life, never thinking that they were enough, and then finally realizing, wait, okay, they are you are more than enough. So, but yeah, the positive affirmation thing for me has been a, a game changer. And ten years ago, if you would have told my, told me that I'd be talking to myself in the mirror in the mornings, I would have been like, no way, I wouldn't have six kids, I wouldn't be talking to myself in the mirror. All these things that you, know, you evolve over time and you figure out what you need and what matters to you and what you want. And that the so how I start my day, how I talk about myself. So I didn't realize with every time I was down on myself, I would talk about it in front of my kids. So it wasn't that I would never say to my kids, oh, you shouldn't wear that. That's too tight or that. I would never say that to them, but I'm saying it about me. Oh, you look horrible in that outfit or those pants are too tight. You gained weight again stuff like that in front of my kids. And how do you think that affects them? Very negatively. So my daughter, who is 18 now, said to me one day, you got to stop being so hard on yourself. You're giving me a complex because of the way you talk to yourself. And that was eye-opening for me. That was like a moment where I was like, whoa, I didn't even realize. I didn't even realize I was doing it. And for her to come to me and say, you got to stop, that was kind of a moment where I was like, wow, she's so right. That's a powerful mirror moment for sure, as us coaches uh, call it, in terms of being able to really just see yourself differently. And kudos to her for being bold and courageous enough to just to say that to you from a place of love, of course, but, you know, to help you see that. Yeah, it was really important. And, and it really kind of changed not just how I talk to myself, but how I talk about myself in front of other people. So I would used to say, I'm just a stay-at-home mom, or I'm just Rob's wife, or I'd be out to dinner with all these people. And they're like, oh, what do you do? Oh, I'm just a stay-at-home mom. Why am I justifying staying home? Why am I justifying? Because raising good humans is really the most important job in the world. But here I am justifying because I'm not the CEO of a big company or I'm not the president of this. And it took me a long time to say, wait, I don't need to compare myself to these people. I don't need to, I need to compare myself to myself and see what I'm capable of and just be the best me I can be. Usually I, I like to have one little takeaway or a challenge for the listeners to just kind of think through and meditate on for themselves. And so is there anything that you have in your grab bag there uh, that you'd like to share? Because it was such a pivotal moment for me, take a look at how you're talking about yourself and how you, the things that, how hard you are on yourself. Being hard on yourself actually just creates procrastination. You can't move forward if you can't give yourself a break. And I think if you can look at yourself and look at the, the, amazing things you're doing because everybody's doing amazing things. They are, they just don't realize it and continue with that. So I would say journaling about, wait, how do I talk about myself? How, what am I saying about myself and how that, when you talk negatively about yourself, you can't feel positively about yourself. So I think starting there and really saying, okay, I need to feel this about myself instead of being so negative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I work with a lot of high achievers and type A's and 
as one myself, I'm very familiar with that negative critic uh, <laughs> that rarely ever shuts up. Depending on your personality, it can be a lot more debilitating. And for some people, it's, it's what helps push them, not recognizing that sometimes in that push, there's also negativity that comes with it. Yeah. I was doing some research actually for a speech that I'm working on and it is unbelievable how hard we are on ourselves as women. So one of the pieces of data I found, and it's within the last couple of years, that only 4% of women worldwide feel that they're beautiful. 4%. Like that is mind blowing. And that 78% of girls, by the time they reach 17, don't like their bodies. Like, okay, we, we need to do better. We need to do better because, and again, that it starts with me, right? The way I talk about myself, the way I behave in front of my children. If they see that I'm unhappy with my body. Well, how are they going to, they're going to look at themselves. Well, if mom's unhappy, then I should be unhappy too. And just starts that whole cycle again. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Such staggering statistics. 4% of women think they're beautiful. Yeah. And I'm obviously, I'd be curious to, to understand what the standard of beauty is that they were measuring themselves against. And I think that's a big part of it is everybody has a different standard, right? Like if someone said, do you think you're beautiful? Would you instantly say yes? Or would you say, let me think about it. What am I, com- who am I comparing myself to? And, but I think it's the, the quick response of, do you think you're beautiful? And we all should be saying yes, because we're all unique. We're all unordinary and we all have these extraordinary pieces within us. Yeah. And so as we wrap up here, is there a special project that you're working on or that is available that you'd love to share with the, the listeners? It's not up yet, but I'm working on some affirmations that they can download from my website. And then for me, I'm working on a new keynote that hopefully I'll be able to get it out there in the world. And every day is something new. I I love the human connection piece, love being able to talk to new people and get on podcasts. And it's always such a great experience to meet new people and learn from them. So that's what I'm doing on a regular basis. Love it. And and where can the listeners find your book? So if you go to my website, simonekinego.com, last name is K-N-E-G-O, you can find all kinds of information about me and links to basically Barnes & Noble, Amazon, most online bookstores have it and also independent bookstores as well. As far as connecting with you on social, where do you play? Facebook. Instagram, LinkedIn, author Simone Canego. If you search me, you will find me. And I would love to hear from you. If you read my book, if you have a comment, a question, again, my I really love the human connection piece. So reach out. I'd love to have a conversation. Awesome. And so Simone's website, along with her social handles, will be included in the show notes uh, as well. So be sure to check that out and connect with her and let her know that you heard her on the Journey to Becoming podcast. And so one final question for you that I ask all of the guests, what do you know now that you wish that you could share with your younger self? Oh, so many things, but really to embrace the bumps in the road, going back to the not being so hard on herself, on myself. I look back to when I was a teenager and I had a boyfriend that said to me that I looked fat and I was 120 pounds at the time and I'm five foot six. So I was really pretty thin and I couldn't get over it. Like I was after that, I was like eating lettuce and all of these things where like, why am I listening to someone else tell me? How do I feel about myself? So if I could go back in time, I would say, don't be so hard on yourself and really embrace those bumps in the road because life is all those bu- life is about those bumps in the road. You, you really just need to look at yourself and see that you are amazing. You are unordinary. You are extraordinary and you're bringing your gifts to the world. So embrace that. 
Thank you so much, Simone, for coming on. Again, please check the show notes for Simone's contact information, links to her website, uh, links to access a copy of her book as well. I sincerely appreciate you sharing your story, journey, and the nuggets that you've learned along the way. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode. I hope you were able to grab a few nuggets and some action items that you can begin implementing this week. I'll be back next week with some more actionable tips to help you along your journey of transition, change, and transformation. In the meantime, please be sure to subscribe and leave a comment on the platform of your choosing. And if you really enjoyed this content, go ahead and share it with your network. Share it with a friend, a family member, whoever it is you know that might benefit from the information that was shared today. Until next time, have a wonderful and purposeful week.